Hello biggies and welcome to a location we have never shot in before. This is a fine dining restaurant. In an about an hour's time, the great and the good of the British beer writing press will be gathered here to tuck into a tasting menu prepared by Adam of the Brewers Association. Now Adam is an incredible chef and one of the leading lights of the beer and food matching movement, I'm gonna call it a movement. And he's gonna be telling us how beer lost its place at the fine dining table and how we can get it back there. Beer and food, food and beer. If you're anything like us, you probably consume them together all the time. But do you ever stop and think, do these two things taste good together? Do they add to each other or change each other? Do they compare or do they contrast? Those are the key questions to ask yourself if you're looking to match your beer with your food. It may sound complicated, but it really isn't. That's because they were born to go together and nearly as varied as each other, leaving you plenty of options to play with. Sweet malts add body and depth to dishes, bitter hops create complexity and bite, acidity lightens and cuts through, and carbonation lifts and cleanses. That all happens without you trying. All you need to do is choose which of those effects you want to focus on and choose the style that will help that happen. So why does wine, a comparatively simpler and less diverse drink, still dominate the dinner table? And how do we elevate beer and food matching beyond these simple rules to encourage diners and indeed chefs to take craft beer seriously? If anyone knows the answer to those questions, it's Adam Doolay, head chef of the Brewers Association. As well as championing the interest of America's independent breweries, the BA has made getting beer back on the drinks list one of its main priorities. And who were we to argue when they asked if they could put their case to us at a four-course beer dinner? So Adam, thank you so much for joining us. I can't think of a, a better person to talk to about beer and food in the whole world. So um, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you. Let's start with uh, what we're drinking. So what have you brought over for us? Uh, this is actually something that'll be featured a little bit later in the launch. This is from Virginia Beer Co. Uh, this is uh, Baker's Ordinary Bitter, so 4%. 97% of the ingredients actually came from the UK. So something a little fun to throw about, but. So you've, you've come all the way from the States and brought us the classic British style. It's a bold move in what's going to be a room of British yeah, we like, we, I mean, yeah, we like, you know, we're, we like the entertainment value for it because <laughs> it's the, the commentary there, so. Um, right, well, why don't you, in your own words, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we're going to dig into, into beer and food. You know, culinary background, formally trained as a chef and then kind of just fell into beer, actually randomly happened on top of an event at a mountain in Vail and there was a whole bunch of red wines and it was really, really hot and one brewery and uh, it, it snowballed from there uh, over the course of the last several years of just adding more things and getting to know brewers and learning about the similarities between it. And I think probably the best connection to give you is that the, the closeness between a chef and a brewer is that a good brewer or a good chef will tell you anything, right? They'll tell you, they'll give you the recipe uh, because it's not about the recipe, it's about you as a person and how you make it. And so that's, that's really where all the similarities started to kick in was you know, oh, everybody shares here because in, in other segments, there's, there's a lot of close guarded secrets and people think that like holding those is there and that's not what we do in the industry of for cooking or for brewing. So there's a, you think there's a confidence in, in being a chef and your abilities and that's kind of mirrored in being a brewer and the abilities that you bring. You, you can use the same ingredients, but it's yeah. your personality that comes through. It's your personality, it's the skill, it's knowing the difference between, uh, you know, a couple degrees of temperature and what it does, time, uh, and, and that and touch, mm -hmm. you know, there's science behind both of them, but then there's also the touch to it as well. The magic. Yeah. Nice. So it feels to me like beer and food have a long, long history together in that, you know, we used to drink beer as a, a safer alternative to water, um, which meant that we were, you know, serving beer with, with most meals historically. Um, but then it feels like beer has almost been kind of removed from the dinner table to some extent in modern times. Do we know why that's happened? Uh, you know, if there's, uh, there's a lot of different theories on it. You know, one was part of a, a status thing, you know, like what you said, beer was rationed. Uh, and it was what you had, you know, X amount of liters were given to you if you were working in the field or it was given to you instead of water. And so that was viewed as that. Uh, other parts of it became that, that uh, wine and spirits were viewed as a little bit higher. And so you would have beer before, but then you would have wine with dinner. And so uh, then as more and more styles started to emerge, more creativity started to emerge and the flavors came around, uh, as well as the fact that you can play across so many spectrums of the alcohol and the carbonation and how that relates, 
really started cracking into in the last 20 years what beer and food can do together and then even more so in the last 10 years. Because I guess, you know, there's always been diversity in brewing, but it's always been regional. So in a certain region, you'd have a style that dominates and you wouldn't have access to everything else. Whereas, you know, thanks to like the American craft beer revolution and the fact that spread everywhere, suddenly, you know, you can get a, a Berlin of Ice and Imperial Stout yeah. and IPA lager all made by the same brewery, let alone in the same city region. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you also have the creativity of all, all the brewers and what they're pushing for and new styles that they're trying to do and, you know, where they what's happening with hops, what's happening with all of the different ranges that they're bringing together to just kind of really push the industry forward. At the same time, culinary industry is doing the same thing. You know, you look at what's happening around the world, but if you specifically focus on like Europe and UK and States, you know, there's also a culinary revolution happening right alongside what's happening with brewing. And you've got a group of chefs that are starting to define what new cuisine is right alongside what's happening with the, you know, kind of the push of what the beer styles are becoming. And that, that culinary revolution, what, where's that sort of leading? What's, what's been changing there? Uh, it, you know, it's, it's just really about um, people being able to cook what they want to cook, right? It's, that's, that's the ultimate story is if you, if you talk to brewers, you know, the, the best brewers out there, they brew the beer that they want to drink. So now where that's happening in the food world is you're talking to all these chefs and they're cooking food that they want to cook, right? It's no longer about chasing necessarily that that Mich the, the Michelin star and playing to that. It's okay, does, my, does what I'm doing match up to that? And if so, then great. Mm -hmm. But if not, I'm gonna do, I'm, I'm gonna cook what I wanna cook. Mm. Which I guess it felt like in, in the country world, like a lot of the time, I think that was probably called like fusion or something where you bring lots of ideas to the table and that term seems to have gone. And it's a bit like beer where we often talk about beer styles, but we've seen most innovations in brewing come from taking a beer style and then going, but also this, which is, you know, how New England IPA kind of. Exactly. Kind of that, I guess, yeah. yeah. You're seeing it now with the, what's happening with all the chefs that are coming out and, and cooking food that is true to them and not, you know, this is what I learned, this is what I was trained on, and now, you know, I do this way. You're seeing that happen, and so you're, that's in turn allowing beer to come into play, and it's creating kind of a new level of dining, right? You're starting to see more and more uh, of tablecloth settings go away. You're starting to see people being able to be more relaxed. Uh, and you're starting to see that it's, it's about going out for the, the food, the place, and the beverage. And that shift is what's going to start bringing that culture in and start building it. It's going to take a little bit of time, right? That's, that's where we all don't have the patience. Like, we wanted this to happen five years ago, but we probably still got another five years to go. A lot of the sort of the fine dining, the hugely respected dining or cuisine nations, you know, France, Italy, Spain, are all kind of wine regions, which is potentially held beer back a little bit, you know, if, if the Czech Republic had a world famous uh, beer scene, uh, sorry, food scene, then maybe suddenly we'd all be drinking delicious side pour decocted pilsners, you know, at, at these fine dining restaurants. So it feels like just through, through the, the fact that beer has always encouraged a certain kind of, or always used to encourage a certain kind of cuisine, it means that it's, it's not been held in such high regard. And now with that diversity you talked about, we're starting to see that just because it you know, goes really well with dumplings, with burgers, with whatever it is, it doesn't mean it can't be, like, you know, we've got pilsners on this menu today, right? Yeah, two. That are gonna be fantastic with... Um, Pickled watermelon and a little bit of, yeah, they're gonna play off of acid and spice. Yeah. And it's just gonna pop and you're gonna see what noble hops and carbonation can do. course except for the dessert in this meal is going to come with two beers which is my kind of beer pairing dinner uh, so I've just been handed a glass of the Paradox Brewery Pilsner a very very different lager uh, to that first one which was sort of rice based light refreshing crisp this one's got a kind of Czech feel to it it's really really bready which actually replaces the the bread that came with the meal pretty much it's really nice and adds kind of a, a broader bready caramelly sweetness to the dish almost like you've dunked your bread in it um, another great match is with the butter which has mustard in it uh, um, so yeah, two lagers, two entirely different ones. One nostal nostalgic crusty bread, one all freshness and light uh, with, that, with that original Asian lager. So you, you sort of hinted at it just then, but it feels like because beer lost its space at the table to, to wine, it almost has to be nudging wine back off the table to, to get onto it. Is, is it fair to say that there's more you can do with beer than perhaps with wine? 
There isn't, yeah, yes and no. You know, it's, it's not necessarily to say it's a competition. It's the, the, there is room for everything in there. Um, there are a few things that beer has that, that um, gives it an edge. One of the biggest ones is carbonation. Uh, and the way carbonation reacts on the palate, specifically it triggers uh, a nerve that relates to memories. And, and still wine doesn't have that. Literally carbonation stimulates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, it, there's, there's two things that happen. In, in relation of how this can work, and it's uh, the trigeminal nerve that's in the back of your neck. Uh, carbonation and capsation, or heat, are the two things that trigger it. And that goes right to the memory center. And so that's, you know, when we write menus um, or we do tastings for events, um, I don't necessarily want to know what the beer tastes like. I want to know what the beer makes you think about, right? And I want to, you know, does this make you think of a hot summer day? Does this bring up a funny memory, a bad memory? And then you can pull, what would you like to eat with that? Or what, what food do you kind of think about with that? And then that creates a story there. So next course, the fish course. Um, what I've got is a, a cannelloni of bricks and crab with a spicy, spicy mango salsa. You know, you wouldn't necessarily associate putting IPA big, bold, bitter, fruity um, with a fish. So we're going to see how that is. I've got two beers. One is a big, bold kind of West Coast. They call it a San Diego one, so bitter but juicy. Um, and that's the Coronado Brewing. And then I've got um, a joint resolution from DC Brow, which is a really unusual beer. Like, the brewer, when he was talking, he said that they, they use uh, Michigan copper, I think was the hop he said, uh, that brings like a melon kind of vibe to it. But actually, I get rose water really strongly, like Turkish delight, which is a really nice aroma to go with that kind of juiciness. I think it's going to work really well with the fish. We've got smoky fish around the outside, creamy crab, spicy salsa, unbelievable. Once you get it, there's a couple of really That's lovely. Melts with the cream, cuts through with the, the kind of juiciness, and yeah, I'm left with a, a rose water floral kind of character. Really complex match, not like the others who just came together like, like bread and bread and tomato, but that is kind of clashing in a glorious way and leaving something to remember afterwards. Do you think that beer almost can have an advantage against wine because it's lost its place on the table historically? There are less, there are less restraints, less rules around, you know, this particular wine goes with fish. There are, there, are, there are less constraints and that you can, we can write a, a new rule book or throw away the rule book totally. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the best things about it because it's exactly what you said. There, is, there are no rules with it. And, you know, it, you can come up to somebody and say, hi, you know, do you feel like something a little bit crisp and minerally with a kind of an effervescent note to it? You don't know if I just said a beer, wine, or a cocktail. Now I have the advantage of bringing a beer to you and you have that burst of carbonation that happens with whether it's acid or whether it's fat and, and the reaction that happens on the palate. And you have all these aha moments that people are like, oh, I really like that, right? You also have that to battle against as well too is there's a lot of people out there that their thought about beer is that it's you know, a, a light pilsner that's, and that's what mm -hmm. it is. Or that it's you know, um, not something that they would have there. And so to bring them something that's crisp, cold, refreshing, cuts through the acid or bites to that, you get these moments that people are just like, oh, and you see it. It's amazing to see their faces when they're just like, oh, I like that. Are, are there rules that you can sort of apply or, or techniques that you can apply? Like obviously you said it's quite subjective, but are there the science bit? Yeah, there are. So this is a good example to talk about of the, like this, this ordinary bitter. Um, we're pairing this with duck today, uh, but specifically a duck breast and then also some uh, roasted carrots and what's called a potato press, um, which right now they're um, finishing frying in clarified butter because why not? <clears throat> but this, the reaction there that happens is that when you, when you sear a duck breast, same as when you put malt into a kiln, is called a Maillard reaction. And that's a chemical reaction that happens that creates that toasty, bready flavor. When you start to have those connections in there and you start to build those layers, same thing of roasting a carrot, uh, you build a depth of pairing that you don't have in wine, right? Because wine's, coming, wine's never heated, right? It, yeah, you're coming from a single ingredient of a grape, whereas in this, you're looking at different layers of roasted malt and barley that 
really contribute to those flavors and tie into the same scientific method that you're cooking from there. And then flip it to after this beer in the same course, this is how we're talking about pushing things is right after this beer, you're going to have a creek. So yeah, you know, you can move from something like that where you have a 4% bitter to an 8% creek by using food. Mm -hmm. Because if you just sat this and a creek next to each other and you went like this, you wouldn't taste this after that. But if you use food, you can bridge it and go back and forth. Within the same course. Within the same course. So we knew we were in for a treat when we came, but we're really getting into the meat of it. I've got a delicious creek, uh, so a cherry beer, a cherry sour um, from Upslope, which is smells of almond uh, and, well, cherry, let's, let's be brutally honest. And it smells absolutely incredible and jammy um, and unctuous. And that's gonna be going with um, with my duck. It's a classic pairing, cherry and duck. And then we've got a British bitter. Um, so I'm excited to see how that will pan out. Like a really rich flavor of meat with, this bitter is, is really bright and dry and loads of kind of Golding's character, not like the really malty treat that we get in the UK. It's got a bit of honey malt for a bit of character. Um, so yeah, now you're just watching a guy eat his dinner at this point. Enjoy. <laughs> That's a very good duck. Lovely sauce. I'm mixing up my beers. I'm not used to having two. So that brings fruitiness. Actually, brings out like the umami. Of the, um, of the potato, which is beautifully pan fried as well. And yeah, adds sweetness and depth and fruitiness to a you know, meaty, heavy dish. It's really lovely. That acidity is perfect to doing that as well. So deep fried, breadcrumbed, spicy bit of blackberry underneath. Kind of creamy, briskety kind of texture, really nice. You know, the brewer mentioned honey malt, and I didn't get a huge amount of it when I first drank it. As soon as I've had that very creamy, meaty kind of texture, the honey just leapt out. Lovely, sweet, like I've stuck my face into a pot of honey. Um, which is what food, food and beer matching can really do. You can create something, bring something out that you didn't necessarily know was there to start with. It feels like, you know, by putting Maillard and Maillard together, we're, we're comparing and then you, you're sort of contrasting with that, that creek and that, that duck thing, which is another powerful way that you can create these, these matches. They don't have to be similar, which I think a lot of people do with beer and food matching. They'll put an imperial stout with chocolate, yeah. which can be quite powerful, but it doesn't have to be that way shouldn't be that way anymore either because that's the that's that's where we went wrong with beer a little bit is we ended with these we built right you would start light you would build 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 and then the end was this imperial stout with this rich chocolate and heaviness and then people would be leaving the meals and they'd be like oh i don't ever want to do that again that's the the side of it is use food to go all the way through same thing we're doing here today and we've been doing for years is trying to push chefs towards working with lighter beers. Uh, and you end light, you wake people up and their palates become refreshed and they, they leave going, oh, I don't feel like I just had five courses of food at you know, midday on a Wednesday. Yeah, which is I, like certainly when I've spoken to people, it's been one of those issues of beer and food and that people are like, I don't want, well, I don't want a pint with my meal. And you, know, you obviously don't have to serve beer and pints, but people consider beer just through the, the greater volume that you might consume to be heavy. Yeah. So if you then, yeah, finish with these big, heavy matches um, <clears throat> that don't cut through each other, exactly, you walk away going, oh, beer and food's a bit heavy. Maybe I want a, a white wine with something. Or... Yeah. So you said it's amazing to sit and watch people have these sort of light bulb moments yeah. around these matches. What were the, what are the ones that you might use, you know, the most powerful matches you've ever had that were those light bulb moments for you? That's a hard question. Um... You know, really it started working with, with like more about like working with hops and, and flavor profiles, you know, and seeing where people reacted with heat, with spice, um, 
<clears throat> and also what what you could do with hops or how a beer was hopped and where it could play, whether it could play with dessert, whether it could play with fat, whether it could play with acid and pickling, and really kind of moving that uh, kind of across the spectrum has been one, of, I think, one of the more fun things uh, on, a, on a culinary path for me. You know, like pickles uh, and the acidity that happens in there and how they relate to it, and then you can totally change how that hop feels by going to the next thing and, and adding fat to a dish and kind of coating the palate. And then when you coat the palate, the hops go more up into your kind of nasal sensory areas, and if you use acid, they push down. And you get to just, it's just fun to play with. Mm. That, that play, that, the idea of play, um, I don't feel like you could go to a winery and say, can you elevate this or can you bring that down in the same way that you might go to a brewer and, and sort of specify a beer? Yeah. Is that something you do? Like in yeah, your restaurant? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can, once you do, once starting to develop a relationship with brewers, you can absolutely go to them and say, here's what I'm thinking about, here's what I do. And they either may have a beer for that, because like what you just said earlier is, you go into an individual brewery and they have 15, 20, whatever, however many styles, or they'll also be willing to play. And that's the other nice, fun thing about it is, you know, you can really, if you get your timing right, uh, you know, within a month, you can get a beer you want at your table. It doesn't work that way with wine or with spirits, right? Longer process, more natural process that happens and what you get is what you get. Whereas with this, if you were like, hey, you know, we're sitting here now in August. If we wanted to do something in October, we could find a brewery to work with and we could say, here's exactly what we're looking for. And so we come to, sadly, the final dish of the day, which is this delicious cold mess of charred pineapple, coconut ice, and lime meringue. If that's not delicious enough, we're gonna be pairing it with raw pineapple, which is uh, in the form of this beer from Mary Brunko uh, over in Hawaii. Um, so this is their pineapple beer. It's made with, pine with a, a local pineapple, Maui Gold pineapple, which we've just been told is the best pineapple in the world. Uh, so we'll see how it compares to this pineapple. Um, so what we're hoping is this gonna be lovely acidity, sweet, a wheat crackeriness is going to bring depth uh, to this very sweet and slightly acidic dish. I don't know which it goes in which hand and how you use this, so uh, we're flying blind here. There we go, and a bit of meringue. So I'm curious, and apparently, there we go. Contains a bunch of these Wait, it's in a glass. What's lovely about that is you expect the beer to be sweet, but after that assault of delicious, of pineapple and lime and zestiness and that nice creamy coconut, it washes it all away, leaving you with just pure pineapple on the finish. So it means that you've got this dish which is all about trying to balance out that acidic sweetness, and what you're left with is the aromatics of pineapple. So it's a beautiful way to do it, a beautiful way to finish this. Nice and light, like Adam said, he likes his desserts when he does these dishes. Um, and it's absolutely stunning that it managed to add something even though it's the same ingredient. So something that I think that restaurants, particularly restaurants where maybe there's going to be white tablecloths and, and wine glasses and stuff on the table, have struggled with is this, you know, to some extent the perceived value of beer being lower, but also sometimes, you know, almost the, the kind of theatre of it. You know, wine has this wonderful ability to be, you know, a big sharing bottle, to be an expensive outlay, something that's special for a, a special treat. And, you know, I know from my time working in beer distribution that there's a resistance to, say, cans on, on you know, white tablecloths. There's a resistance to, you know, from restaurateurs who are like, you know, why would I sell a, a, an eight pound can of beer when I could sell a 30, 40 pound bottle of wine? Um, how, how does beer sort of cut through those conversations and say, you know, the experience can be better. It, it, that's where it comes back down to the guest and really saying you want the, you know, uh, in order to succeed right now in, in the restaurant world or in the hospitality world, it's not about what you want to do, it's about what the guest wants. And, and they want a memorable experience. They're going to seek to repeat something they remember. So having the ability to go to beer is, is one part of it. Um, the other part of it is being okay serving it, right? That's the first thing is you have to train staff to not shy away from the beer. 
uh, and, and actually help encourage people to try it. And I, you know, I absolutely agree with what you're saying of people like, you know, the, the visual of a bottle of wine or a large format bottle of wine versus a can of beer, but there can also still be the presentation, right? Uh, it can't be the old, you know, put the can down on the table, pop it open, walk away. You have to have the presentation of the pour, everything like that to connect in. Uh, and then let the beer do the work from there. Let the flavors of it happen. And, you know, like the glasses that you guys are enjoying in right now. Going back to what you said, can't do a pint of beer with every course. You've got to be able to do smaller pours. And you're, we're even seeing, you know, uh, even being around here and some of the pubs around here, you can get quarter and half pours now. You know, it's, it's becoming more and more okay to say, I want four ounces, six ounces of beer. I guess the thing we haven't quite talked about in this is, is the fact that a lot of tap rooms also serve food, right? So there's an education piece there as well, because a lot of the time when we drink beer in tap rooms, we're also going to be increasingly eating in those locations as well. And it feels like breweries have actually done an incredibly good job of putting good menus together. Yeah. But it, it is often of a type. It's often sort of Mexican barbecue, pizza, burgers, essentially. Yeah. You're seeing that change as well too, right? Uh, as, as people's palates change and it evolves and what they want. Kind of goes back to that finishing a meal light, right? Yes, there will always be going into uh, being able to have a pint and have a burger or have you know, chips or have the, you know, whatever it is there, but there's also the room to expand further, right? And that's where a lot of it can come into play because now what you have to think about is the other avenue to bring people in is you may be in a group of people, like if the three of us are going out and we know we're going somewhere and it's every, we can get pints and burgers all day long. Well, what if that's not what I want, right? And that's where you've got that education piece of, now you gotta look at the pub and say, okay, we've got three people coming into you. Do you wanna sell three pints or do you wanna sell six pints and food? Mm-hmm. Here's how you do that. You have to elevate your food game, right? They know you've got the beer. Now you've gotta show them that you've got a variety of food that they can have as well. And then that's, that's how you end up the pub owners start growing their sales. And it's like, you're not only just standing out there having a beer, you're like, oh, we'll stay here and eat too. So do you find, in, you're in the sort of upper echelons of fine dining, do you find people are coming to you for an adventure, for an experience more so these days? Um, and they're more open-minded, their approach to, to dining in general is, is more about being told what, what might work together. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the, especially coming out of the last couple of years that we've all gone through, People are looking for an experience. They're looking for somebody to guide them. And, and it's not about going, looking at a menu and saying, oh, they have the beer I want, they have the dish I want. It's about looking at it and building that level of trust, right? It's about looking at a chef or the staff at a place and saying, I know if I go in here, I can sit down and just say, entertain me, let's go. And that's, that's the level that it's coming to now is building that trust where someone will come in and just say, Every time I've been in here, the experience has been amazing. I trust you. Let's go. And that's the dream for you, right? Absolutely. It's, it's trust, and yeah. that's what it's all about, be- yeah. creating beautiful yeah. experiences. Yeah. And, and I guess also it, it's that parity, right? It's this idea that, you know, I don't think beer should be trying to be better than wine necessarily. Like, like you said earlier on, like the dream would be a tasting menu where there's, you know, good cider, good beer, and good wine. Yeah. And whichever is the best pairing for that particular dish is, is, is what should be there. And that yeah. would be the dream if all three of these amazing forms of drink had the same place on the table. It's just what works best. Absolutely. Well said.